from Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Hannah Zuberi. First, the headlines. Over one million Ukrainians flee Russian bombings. Muslim and African students in Ukraine not allowed to leave. International law defines state-sponsored crackdown on French Muslims as persecution. First Nations tribe in Canada locates 169 potential unmarked graves. Milwaukee assistant city attorney who worked for anti-Islamic groups fired. UN takes historic step towards global treaty on plastic trash. In our top story tonight, more than a million Ukrainians have fled since the Russian invasion began last week, according to the head of the United Nations Refugee Agency. So far, more than 2,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed due to the military incursion, Ukrainian State Emergency Service said Wednesday. Russia reported 498 Russian troops have been killed and close to 1,600 more have been injured. About 15,000 Ukrainians are sheltering in the Kiev metro to avoid Russian shells. The underground system was built in the wake of World War II. The United Nations General Assembly on Wednesday adopted a resolution demanding Russia's immediate withdrawal from Ukraine. It was a powerful rebuke of Moscow's invasion by a majority of the world's nations. After more than two days of debate during which the Ukrainian ambassador accused Russia of genocide, 141 out of 193 UN member states voted for the non-binding resolution. China and India were amongst the 35 countries which abstained. Five countries, Eritrea, North Korea, Syria, Belarus and Russia, vetoed, voted against the resolution. The resolution does not condemn the invasion but deplores in the state strongest terms. Russian Ambassador Valentin Rybakov blasted sanctions imposed by the West on Russia. The International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor opened an investigation Wednesday into allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity or genocide by Russia. The crimes in questions have been allegedly been committed in Ukraine since 2013 and during Russia's current invasion. Prosecutor Karim Khan previously said he planned to seek approval from the court's presidency to launch the investigation. But 39 nations had referred allegations to the court, enabling his office to move forward, he said. More than a million Ukrainians have fled their homeland into neighboring countries, according to the UN. However, foreign students and non-whites continue to face problems leaving. This is what Maysoum Ahmed, a Pakistani student in Kiev, had to say. We all have, we all have our all documents. If you, if you just see over there, every Ukrainian is just going to pass. They are just passing one by one, one by one. From three nights, only this crowd is standing because we are foreigners. We are treated like a shits, dogs. We were sleeping on these footpads and we were using this as a pillow. Somebody was uh, just laying on the floor even though uh, some of uh, our guys just fainted at night, but they don't care. These Ukrainian, they he don't did. care. Algerian student Ayman al dabab also shared his experience. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> The European Union Commission spokesperson said all people fleeing the war in Ukraine should be allowed into the EU regardless of their nationality, ethnicity or skin color. The leader of Spain's Vox Party said Wednesday Ukrainian refugees, not Muslim migrants, should be welcomed into Spain. Santiago Abascal told the parliament anyone can tell the difference between Ukrainian refugees and the invasion of young military-aged men of Muslim origin. He accused Muslim refugees of having launched themselves against European borders in an attempt to destabilize and colonize it. 
Vox had been a has seen a sharp rise in popular support in recent weeks. It threatens to overtake the center-right popular party, which is undergoing a major crisis due to infighting. A First Nations tribe in Canada said Tuesday it has found 169 potential graves at the former Guard Mission site, a residential school known for serious abuse of students. The graves were located using ground-penetrating radar and a specialized drone, Kawapio no First Nation officials said. The mission, also called the St. Bernard Mission School, is in the northern part of the province of Alberta. It was operated by the Catholic Church from 1894 to 1961. Canada's Tooth and Reconciliation Commission has spent years investigating abuse at former Indian residential schools. In its final 2015 report, the commission said only 10 graves had been reported at the mission. The United Nations on Wednesday agreed to start negotiating a global treaty on plastic pollution. The move has been hailed as a watershed moment for the planet. Nearly 200 nations at the UN Environment Assembly in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, agreed to create an intergovernmental committee to negotiate and finalize a legally binding treaty by 2024. Assembly Chair Espen Barte Eid, Norway's climate and environmental minister, declared the resolution passed amidst cheers and applause. Eid said, we are making history today. The treaty addressed not just the bottles, straws and shopping bags floating in rivers and oceans, but invisible microplastics as well. Those microplastics can be found in the deepest oceans, the highest mountains, and are within the air, soil and food chain. According to a new report, France's treatments of its Muslims fit the definition of persecution under international law. CAGE is an independent advocacy organization that seeks to empower communities impacted by the war on terror's policies worldwide. It said in its latest report that the persecution of French Muslims is in line with Article 7 of the Rome Statute. The French government's decision to dissolve two prominent Muslim NGOs in late 2020 shocked French and European Muslims. That gave way to a draconian crackdown on Muslims and Muslim civil society in France, critics say. Last month, France's interior minister announced a ban on two Palestine solidarity organizations at the behest of French President Emmanuel Macron. They are the latest examples of a state-sponsored crackdown on Islam and Muslims that has been growing under Macron's leadership. France has closed or dissolved 718 Muslim organizations, including schools, mosques, and businesses. The government has also seized nearly $51 million in property assets of Muslims. Bringing more news stories after the break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Assalamu alaikum. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. Brothers and sisters, we all watch the Allahu Akbar lady from India. She is amazing, isn't she? She is neither compromising her hijab nor her education. She is standing tall. We must stand with her. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect her. But it is not just hijab, brothers and sisters. Indian Muslims are facing genocide. Genocide that we face in India is not a new phenomenon. India has had several genocides. They are attacked every day. Even the Indian government admits there has been more than 1800 organized attacks on Muslims, but they call it right. 
660 people are hanged to death in India, lynched in broad daylight, sometimes just because they were accused of eating beef. Yes, accusation of eating beef can kill a human being in India. We cannot remain silent, can we? Alhamdulillah, OIC has spoken, that is good. But why in the world United Nations is silent? The UN has a responsibility to protect. It has a duty to prevent genocide. Sisters and brothers, we must stand with Indian Muslims and other minorities. We are free, they are not. We are not attacked, they are under attack day and night. Let's do our job. I have signed this UN petition. I ask you to sign it now. Thank you so much. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Welcome back. In domestic news today, Chicago-based Pillars Fund released the winners of the 2022 Pillars Catalyst Fund grants. The organization amplifies the leadership, narratives, and talents of American Muslims. This year's $2 million in grants will support 32 Muslim-led nonprofits. It's the largest funding amount in a single year. Pillars president and co-founder Kashif Sheikh emphasized how Muslims are on the front lines of issues such as civic engagement, criminal justice reform, and mental health. The Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, or ISPU, a group behind numerous research initiatives tailored towards understanding the needs of American Muslims, is among the recipients. ISPU Executive Director Myra Nigaz explained how the grant will allow the group to pursue new research projects this year. A video posted on social media by eighth graders making violent racist comments at the Paxton Buckley Loda school system in Illinois has upset parents at the school. It included the words, kill all the blacks, kill all the blacks, get back in your cage. According to the News Gazette, Kate Grayson, whose five children have attended the school, said the video was the last straw. She said all of her children have faced racism and that she will now take them out of the district. Superintendent Cliff McClure said the district is investigating the matter in cooperation with the Paxton Police Department. He said the content of the video clearly are offensive and unacceptable. Milwaukee Assistant City Attorney Jennifer DeMaster was fired on Monday. DeMaster's termination came days after the journal Sentinel reported she appeared on Russia Today TV backing Russian President Vladimir Putin's actions leading to the invasion in Ukraine. Russia Today is registered as a foreign agent and is owned and controlled by the state of Russia. However, DeMaster's termination notice did not provide details about why she was fired. The notice to the city's Department of Employee Relations cited only job performance and poor fit. DeMasters also wrote Babylon Unveiled, a book in which she argued that Islam is not a peaceful religion. She has also worked for the Clarion Project, listed by the Southern Poverty Law Center, as an anti-Muslim hate group. A Patterson, New Jersey man has been charged in connection with an alleged bias attack at the Islamic Congregation of North Jersey in December. Edward Wright, who was arrested February 22nd, entered the mosque on Preakness Avenue on December 23rd, the sheriff's office reported. He shoved and struck a prayer leader while yelling in a threatening manner, Sheriff Richard Burdick said. Wright has been railing against the Avan, the Muslim call to prayer at the mosque, which is conducted on a loudspeaker. In March 2020, the Patterson City Council approved changes to the city noise control ordinance, allowing mosques to broadcast the Islamic call to prayer five times a day. Officials said state law already allowed exemptions to noise ordinances for religious services. 
Nearly all Americans have experienced financial, health, and personal losses due to COVID-19. But the pandemic's negative impacts have been greater on American Muslims, according to a survey by the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding. A year into COVID-19, 27% of American Muslims reported losing employment due to the pandemic compared to 19% of the general public. While Muslims were slightly more likely to have lost a job than Black Muslims, Arab Muslims were most likely to have hours or pay cut due to COVID-19. American Muslims were also more likely than the general public to have been hospitalized for COVID-19, the survey shows. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. Assalamu alaikum. This is Imam Malik Mujahid in Chicago. Just like you, I was moved by that Allahu Akbar lady. She stood her ground, fearful of none, for her hijab and for her education. Sisters and brothers, Indian Muslims are facing a genocide. India does not care for Muslim protesting, but it does care for the world opinion. Therefore, we must push the United Nations. The UN has a responsibility to protect. They must prevent genocide. Please sign this UN petition now. Get others to sign. It will help. Trust me, it will help. We need one million signatures, brothers and sisters. Please sign now. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds walk a mile in my shoes walk a mile in my shoes well before you abuse criticize and accuse walk a mile in my shoes dad they took over my bedroom come on come on Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back. To discuss the refugee crisis after the Russian invasion, of Ukraine, where more than a million Ukrainians have fled their homeland into neighboring countries, according to the United Nations. Foreign students and non-whites continue to face problems as they're leaving. To discuss this and much more, we have with us Jamie Webb. She is the president and CEO at United Nations Association in Canada. Thank you so much for joining us, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me. Jamie, please first let us know, what is the work that the United Nations Association does on the ground for refugees? So a little bit of a broader background. And then if you could give us an update from the ground specifically about this new refugee crisis. Thank you. Typically, the United Nations Association in Canada works domestically with refugees once they've arrived here in Canada. We run a number of employment programs to match refugees with good quality jobs. We run a number of training and empowerment programs. And we also have some really unique programming where we provide opportunities to Canadians and Canadian refugees to participate in UN processes, either as interns in UN agencies 
or as delegates to UN meetings. So our mission and mandate is to grow, grow global citizens, and we do that largely in Canada. The new crisis has shifted our work, though. Earlier this weekend, I had a discussion with our sister organization, the United Nations Association in Poland. And they're on the ground helping refugees who are arriving from Ukraine to be settled in Poland and to find the help and support that they need. They're not able to do as much as they need, though, and they're often having to say no and to turn away from support. Earlier this week, they helped four Nigerian nationals who are at the border to get across the border into Poland and to find temporary housing in Warsaw. And they want to do more to help minorities that are being excluded from some of the other assistance that's being provided by agencies. In order to help with that, we've been creating awareness about what the United Nations Association in Poland is doing to help Ukrainian refugees, regardless of their race or background, and to raise funds so that they can find more temporary housing and that they can provide support that the refugees need. What we've actually seen at the moment is the nature of that support has changed. When we first engaged in Poland, there was an urgent need for direct humanitarian assistance, things like clothes, blankets, medicine. Now what we're seeing is that there's been a flood of those supplies, but a number of the refugees are now left in welcome centers where all they have is access to a bed and a basket in which to keep their, their belongings. What we're trying to do with the UN Association Poland is help refugees to start living their lives again in Poland while they wait for the next step, whether it's a return to Ukraine or moving onwards to Canada, the US, or other countries that have opened their doors to them. What happens as uh, sort of guide us through the road that a refugee would take to get to the border and get into Warsaw? Um, we are seeing images um, of packed train stations. What is happening? So uh, I'd like to you, for you to walk us through that path that a refugee is taking. It's so difficult when you're not on the ground to truly understand what the circumstances are that would drive somebody to leave their home and the emotions and feelings that must accompany that, especially when they're having to leave behind family and everything that they know. We're getting briefings, not just from our partners in Poland, but also the International Organization for Migration in Ukraine, where we have a number of Canadian interns placed, um, conducting internships with them, thankfully remotely. And what we're hearing is uh, of, of refugees that are finding any outlet that they can, um, that once the decision is made to, to move, uh, they're heading largely to the Polish border, but we're also hearing stories from refugees that are crossing into Romania and Moldova as well. We've heard that in Romania and Moldova, the situation is much more difficult for refugees. Uh, while the number of refugees that are flowing to those countries is lower, the, c compared to the population and the capacity of the countries, there's a much higher burden put upon Romania and Moldova as an example compared to Poland. So in fact, what we're hearing is that the, the travel to the Polish border and processing across the Polish border is the easiest route for refugees to take. But it's still not easy. We're hearing stories of families with small children having to wait 30, 40 hours on the Ukrainian side of the border before they even get into Poland. We're hearing stories about women with young children and nothing but a shopping bag as the sum total of the, their memories and supplies that they could bring with them. Once they enter Poland, if the refugees have friends or family in Poland, which many Ukrainian nationals do, they're moving on to that housing. But a lot of the foreign nationals that are in Ukraine don't have that support system. So they're staying in the welcoming centers with limited facilities until additional support can be provided. What we're hearing is that for Ukrainian nationals, Poland is waiving the, the visa requirements and they're welcome to stay for as long as they want. Ukrainian children are being registered into Polish schools at this stage and temporary housing is being found. 
For non-Ukrainian nationals, the situation is quite a bit different. Uh, those countries that are extending visas are extending short-term visas, 15 days in Poland, for example, for non-Ukrainian nationals. And there isn't the support system there and there isn't the attempt to integrate the refugees and find them a longer-term solution in Poland. It's more of a stop-off point and refugees are largely left to find their own way to the next place that can um, support them or uh, provide them shelter during these times. Have we seen uh, embassies step in uh, across the world uh, to t get their uh, nationals out? We haven't really been in touch with uh, many of the embassies at this stage. We're reaching out to the Nigerian embassy to see how we can offer support for their nationals that are arriving in Poland. Uh, we have heard stories that many of the African nation embassies are trying to mobilize and provide support for their nationals, but what that support is, we are not entirely sure. Uh, we do know that the UN Information Center is putting out a call to the United Nations Association in Poland to assist with nationals from a number of African countries, uh, which tends to imply that they're not getting the support from the embassy and are having to look at other avenues. Uh, at the moment, the ability of uh, us as UN associations to provide that support is limited, uh, but we are actively fundraising to try to make sure that we can direct support to those refugees that are not provided with any additional support through either the Polish government or through their own home country embassies. How can, um, if you could share that with us, how can people here in the United States help? What we have done is we've asked our partners and said, what is it that's really needed? How can we help the most? How can we contribute the most? Uh, the message that I got this morning from our colleagues on the ground is that there's an urgent need to support with the integration and a support for uh, especially families with young children. So providing support through temporary housing is a really critical need that needs to be met. Moving people out of welcoming centers, regardless of which country it's in, into an apartment uh, somewhere where they can cook the food that they're used to cooking, somewhere where they can sleep in rooms, in separate rooms, um, where they can start to rebuild and as a family and where children can continue to grow and to thrive uh, is one of the most urgent needs that we've heard of. The other urgent need that we've heard is the need for people to be able to tell their stories and for people around the world to listen. Uh, we want to make sure that they're not filtered through the lens of media who are uh, in, in some cases not presenting the most important elements from the perspective of these refugees but are presenting the storyline that they want to, to see. Uh, we have started a fundraising campaign for these two purposes. Uh, you can support that by going to www.unac.org. All of those proceeds are going to support refugees as they cross over into Poland. Thank you so much for your time and for your efforts for people who are going through one of the greatest crises right currently. It's my pleasure. We just wish we could do more. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.